Let's talk about instrumentation. Instrumentation is present in whatever industry you're going to work in as a mechanical engineer, whether you're working as a designer or somebody working on a process in a plant, operating machines, analyzing machines, doing any type of engineering work, eventually you're going to have to work with readings and measurements that were taken by some form of instrument. <clears throat> engineering measurements are usually taken by what we call a transducer. And when we say transducer, it's kind of a general term for just about any type of device that we use for measurement. What a transducer does is it transforms one form of energy into another. An example would be a thermocouple, which converts a temperature differential to an analog voltage. Another example would be a thermometer, where it's converting the temperature, the uh, excitement of the atoms and the liquid, and we're talking about a bulb thermometer, to a length. If you really think about it, what you're reading on the thermometer is the length of the red liquid in the tube. So that's what a transducer does. And we have transducers of all sorts of different types to read all sorts of different variables. Now when I say analog, analog means continuously variable. And this is as opposed to discrete. So if you know what a continuously variable transmission is, it's the difference between a conventional transmission and a continuously variable transmission. Another uh, example would be a dimmer versus a switch, where a dimmer you can adjust infinitely the brightness of light, for example, in a circuit, whereas a switch only gives you a couple of discrete settings. And you might have, say, a three-way switch. It gives you off, dim, and bright. That would be a discrete system, which is what typically digital systems look like whereas a continuously variable system would have this kind of analog behavior. Another example would be the audio signal from a vinyl record versus that from a compact disc. Talk to anybody who has music as like a really intense hobby or somebody who is what we would call an audiophile, somebody who really likes to listen to recordings and likes to talk about the fidelity of sound, will usually have strong opinions about the difference between digital sound, like what's stored on a compact disc, a bunch of binary numbers, and a vinyl record and using tubes as an amplifier, etc. So it's very interesting uh, to see the different applications for analog versus discrete signals. One other example would be an analog clock versus a discrete or digital clock. Now in this case, we would have to have a second hand that is rotating continuously instead of rotating once a second because that would automatically become discrete. But for the analog clock, what we have is this continuous motion of the second hand and then therefore the minute hand and the hour hand they're moving ever so slowly but they are moving and you can take a reading at any given point in time and so whereas with the analog clock you are reading any infinite ratio so any small ratio inside this range the discrete clock can only read to the minutes level so if I was really if I was able to pinpoint the exact snapshot of the second hand, the minute hand, the hour hand on that clock face, I would be only limited by the resolution by which I could read that clock face. Whereas with the discrete clock, I simply can't know any better than what it reads. So in this case, it would be to the one minute level. If I had seconds on the clock, then it would be to the seconds level. So that's the difference between analog and discrete. So usually we set transducers up for one of two kind of broad applications. One of these applications is where you've got a readout that you need to physically read. It's a visual indicator. And so as we look at that visual indicator, we're going to either take a reading like three times a day or something like that, or it's really just there for us to be able to monitor what the system's doing as we're standing next to it. So this is going to be really common. You know, you see this, for example, on any gas tank. You'll see a regulator, and you're monitoring right there. You have the ability to read instantly the, tank in the pressure in the tank and then the pressure at the outlet of the regulator. And you can look there and see those differences. And so for applications like that, we use visual gauges. They're not always analog. Sometimes they are digital visual readouts, and we do that all the time. Um, so you'll see that in many different applications. Sometimes we need to take readings over, say, a really long time span. So say I need to take a reading every 10 seconds for five days and need to take it around the clock. I don't want to pay an engineer to sit there and do that. No engineer wants to sit there and do that. That doesn't make any sense. So we can automate that system by collecting the data digitally. And so usually what we do is one of two things. We either put a visual display or where we need to collect information in such a way that humans really shouldn't be doing it, then we're going to take we're usually going to convert that to an electrical signal that is then read in by what we call an analog to digital converter or ADC through a data acquisition system.
then we can manipulate that data on a computer later. To do this, we need to condition the signal first, usually. Uh, generally, the signal isn't going to look exactly like we want it. We either need to scale it or we need to filter out unwanted frequencies. And so we use different signal processing tools to prepare this data for our analysis. A data acquisition system, or usually DAC for short, DAQ, is a system used to collect and record analog signals usually in digital or discrete form. So what we're going to do is convert this analog signal, this continuous signal, we're going to say this much resolution is okay, so I'm just going to I'm, I'm going to measure it with this kind of meter stick and stick it into the into the computer. And that quote unquote meter stick is bits of memory. We'll talk about that here in a second. And when I say analog to digital converter, that is the actual device, usually a microcircuit, that converts analog signals to that digital data, to those, to those digital signals. So let's look at an example. This is an Ashcroft 1008S analog pressure gauge. And this analog pressure gauge uses what's called a Borden tube. And a Borden tube design is this tube that is actually connected to the pressure that you are measuring. So this pressure that is put into the valve here, or in this case into this threaded stem here, is pushed up into this curved tube. This tube is actually hollow on the inside, this brass tube. And what's going to happen is as that pressure builds up, it's going to want to straighten that tube out. And that tube is going to straighten according to its elastic modulus. It's going to be an elastic deformation. And it's going to be just about linear with respect to the deflection angle about the center of that curve to the pressure. And so that linearity, we know that it's probably going to be linear at least over this range. But that's the motion of the needle. Usually what we find is we have either a mechanism or a gear in the back because the deflection of this actual curved tube is going to be really tiny. So we need to amplify that. So what we're doing is we're doing a mechanical signal processing of sorts. We are amplifying the signal mechanically. And this behavior is going to be analog. It's going to be continuous. If you increase the pressure just one tiny iota, it's going to increase the deflection one tiny iota. And there are other factors that affect the what we call the sensitivity of the instrument, and we'll talk about that too. But in this case, we'll just assume that we have this, this um, relationship, this infinitely variable relationship. So we can see here from the gauge that we're looking at that it has a full-scale range of 0 to 100 PSI. What that means is that it has a full-scale range of 100 PSI. If it read 50 to 150 PSI, it would also have a full-scale range of 100 PSI. It's the difference between the two numbers, not the absolute value. The resolution is the smallest measurement that, that a change in the input variable, in this case pressure, that can, be that can be detected and indicated. So in this case, we look, and what are the smallest graduations here? And we can say, well, that's 60, that's 70. So then we have five measurements in between. So 2 PSI is the smallest resolution. And so we can't really register much of a change beyond what we can read on the face of this device. The accuracy is different than the resolution. The accuracy of the device is the deviation of the reading from the real value. In other words, if I put exactly 14.7 PSI into this thing, is it going to read 14? If I could read it perfectly, would it read 14.7 PSI? What would that actually look like? And if I did this on each one coming off of the line, would I get the same reading? No, I'm going to get variation. I'm going to get some statistical variation. And so there's usually a uh, specification from the manufacturer that says this is the accuracy of the instrument. So if you take a reading of exactly 60 PSI, it's right in the middle of the line, 60 PSI, then how far off will that be? And in this case, from the data sheet for the, the Ashcroft gauge, it's 1.6% of the full scale. So in this case, it's 1.6 PSI either way. So if I'm reading 60, precisely 60 on my scale here, that means that the actual pressure going into the thing is somewhere between 58.4 and 61.6 .6 PSI. So there's going to be some standard error based on the actual Young's modulus of the tube used, etc. Accuracy is usually referred to, uh, it, it fits into the category of systematic error. And so uh, error related to the instrument itself. There's also random or human error to contend with. 
a couple of sources. We'll, we'll go over a couple of sources here. One is the graduations. I can only read within a certain space inside those graduations. So because of the resolution, I can't get a very fine reading off of this. And so we usually say that due to graduations like this, if we have graduations that we're reading, that you can estimate to within plus or minus one PSI. We'll call that a human error because you can't read more accurately than that. Another source of human error could be parallax. And the picture that we have here is actually very good for showing this. If I take a needle reading based on the position of the photographer with respect to this picture, if it looks like it's hovering over 60, it's actually a little past 60 because of the angle difference between me, the needle, and the face. So this is called parallax error. You'll find that really high quality gauges will usually either have the needle just barely off the surface so that it minimizes that parallax error, or you might have a mirror to help align your pupil across the needle into the into the readings. And so there are a number of different ways that you can attack this, and uh, but it is a, a common thing to, to pay attention to. When you're taking a reading, make sure you're taking it straight onto the needle so that you're getting a good alignment of the needle with the actual reading. This is an SSI Technologies P51-100 pressure transducer. This is essentially the same device, or does the same thing, as what we just did with the Ashcroft 1008S, except this is based on a different type of relationship. It's not based on a Borden tube. It's based on a different type of uh, first principles kind of function. And this puts out a uh, an analog voltage signal that we will then convert to a digital signal, or we could read it into a voltmeter if we wanted to and do the conversion by hand. But this is a different type of transducer, but it measures the exact same thing. This uses what's called a strain gauge diaphragm design. There's a little diaphragm inside this, so we have our pressure coming in to our threads here. And across here, there's a diaphragm, a flexible metal diaphragm, and it has a strain gauge on it. The strain gauge is going to measure the deflection of that diaphragm, and then we're going to blow that resistance signal. We're going to convert that to a voltage and then blow that up with an amplifier. And it's going to send me a signal that, an electrical signal that is linearly related to the pressure. This has a full scale range of 100 PSI G. Now when we put a G at the end of the PSI that means it's a gauge pressure. You can kind of see in the side of the gauge there's a hole up here. And what that hole does is it exposes the back end of that diaphragm to the atmosphere. As a result whatever the atmospheric pressure is on the outside if you don't put any pressure into the the pipe nipple there you get zero deflection. So it's only measuring with respect to the atm atmosphere where it's placed at. So we call this gauge pressure. It's the difference between what you're putting into the gauge and what the gauge is sitting at. You might find absolute pressure uh, measurements in different fields depending on what you do. And in those cases, these are sealed at a atmospheric pressure such that if you took this up to the top of a mountain, you would already have a reading without putting any pressure on it. So different gauges are transducers for different applications. In this case, this is a gauge pressure. But this has the same full scale range, 0 to 100 PSI. The resolution, however, this is an analog device. So it's putting out an analog signal, but we don't have a scale to look at yet. We haven't connected it to a digital acquisition system. So the resolution is going to be re dependent on the data acquisition system we select. We'll talk about that. The accuracy in this case from the manufacturer, again, it's on a spec sheet, is 0.5% of the full scale, plus or minus. So plus or minus 0.5 PSI, less than one-third the accuracy, in other words, three times as good as the accuracy uh, of the other device. Now, there are still sources of random error here, but they're not usually human error. In, in this case, the biggest one is going to be noise. We're going to have noise in our signal. Whether we're sitting in a room with fluorescent lamps and those are creating an electric field that is then being read by the wire because it's not shielded correctly or something like that, we'll get sometimes frequencies and signals that, that don't make sense or don't really uh, apply. At the same time, we might have just a signal we're measuring a pressure that is all over the place and is just varying widely very quickly and we can't get a good reading because the response is so fast and it, it might 
mismatch with the response of the, the transducer. And so we have to figure out how we're going to filter out noise <clears throat> from our electrical signal. At the same time, we might have an electrical signal, depending on the transducer, that's really small. So we need to amplify it. Well, when you amplify it, you also amplify the noise. So signal processing is really important with these devices that are putting out these analog signals. The input voltage for this is the voltage supplied to power the transducer. And this will vary in, in the way that you do it from one transducer type to the next. We're going to go over one type here. There are other types elsewhere on the website, and we'll, we'll have tutorials up for those. But in this case, you can supply anywhere from 8 to 30 volts DC, and it doesn't care. You could, you could give it 9.7 volts and it will power the device just fine and it won't affect your output. So that's nice. They do that so that you can put a 12 volt battery on it, you can put a 9 volt battery on it, you can put a 24 volt DC source on it, you can put any number of those sources on it and, and it will function just fine. It'll scale the voltages itself. The output voltage for this is 1 to 5 volts DC. So what it's going to do is it's going to scale the pressure. If you put 0 PSI into it, it'll give you an output of 1 volt. If you put 100 PSI into it, it will give you an output of 5 volts. If you give it 50 PSI, it will give halfway between 1 and 5. So, in other words, 3 volts. So, that's the way that this particular device functions. There are other relationships between input voltage, output voltage, and the full scale range in the reading. This is only one of several. Now, Let's have a brief diversion. We're going to talk about number systems for a moment because we need to. Let's talk about the decimal number system, the number system we use for adding, multiplying, subtracting, counting, that type of thing. If we think about it, what we're doing is we've got a series of switches, and <clears throat> each switch has 10 settings, 0 through 9. The first switch denotes the multiplier of 10 to the 0 here. And so this switch can have either 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, blah, blah, blah. And we're going to multiply that by 10 to the 0, which is 1. We've known this as the 1's place, and the 10's place, and the 100's place, and the 1,000's place. It's just powers of 10. 10 to the 0 is 1. 10 to the 1 is 10. 10 to the 2 is 100. 10 to the 3 is 1,000. And so what we're doing is we're giving each one of these columns a value from 0 to 9. And so in this case, let's say we have 2 in the 10 to the 0 place, or 2 in the 1's place. 4 in the 10 to the 1 place, or the 10's place, 7 in the 100's place, and we've known this since first grade, 700 plus 40 plus 2 is 742. That's how we add. Uh, so the numbers are multiplied by their header value, and then they are added. So 7 times 10 to the 2 plus 4 times 10 to the 1 plus 2 times 10 to the 0 is 742. Now, the binary system works the exact same way, except the switches only have two settings, off and on. This is really useful because transistors are switches, and we can make them really tiny, and we can easily control them with a computer. In fact, computer memory is nothing but a bunch of transistors. Well, computer processors and, and memory banks are transistors. We're coming up with all sorts of different ways to, to do memory these days. But the standard language is binary, and so we have 0 and 1, and that's it. So the switches only have two values, therefore they're multiplied by successive powers of 2 instead of 10. Here's an example. We've got 1 times 2 to the 0, plus 0 times 2 to the 1, plus 1 times 2 to the 2, plus 0 times 2 to the 3, plus 1 times 2 to the 4. And if we do that math, we come up with 21 in decimal. In binary, it's 10101. But in decimal, we would call that 21 if we were counting up. So back to instrumentation. When we read an instrument, like a gauge, like what is shown on the screen here, all we're doing is converting the position of that needle on the dial that we see and comparing it to graduations and kind of doing this comparison in our heads to say, OK, it's greater than this, but less than this, and so the reading must be x. So if the needle was between 60 and 62 and it was like right in the middle, I would estimate 61 PSI and call it good, and it would have a standard resolution error of plus or minus 1 PSI because it's half the resolution. So what we are doing in our minds is basically the same thing that an analog to digital converter does. It uses a series of comparators, which is a, a small circuit, to determine the voltage level at different bits. And so uh, 
because these analog devices we're working with generally have theoretically continuous behavior, the resolution that this analog to digital converter can use is limited usually by the bit depth of this analog to digital converter. So when I say bit, what I mean is the most basic unit of memory is a bit. It's a representation of a binary number. It's really based on a transistor switch. It's either on or off. And with a series of switches, I can represent a binary number. So the number of divisions that I get over a full scale reading, so the number of different combinations of switches that I can have, is 2 to the n, where n is the bit depth of the analog to digital converter. Let's look at an example. Here we've got five switches. The first switch represents the 2 to the 0 power. The second switch represents 2 to the 1, 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4. If we think about this and look at our number, and this is from our previous example, 10101, that means with five switches or five bits, I can represent up to 32 divisions. So 32 numbers or um, 32 different values that I can come up with. And so if I evenly space those over my reading range for the analog to digital converter, whether I'm reading, say, 0 to 5 volts, if I space that over 32 divisions, then I can figure out what my resolution is effectively. And so here, 5 bits gives me 32 divisions, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 through 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So how do we get from analog signal all the way to discretized digital data? Let's say for a moment that we have our 0 to 100 PSI pressure transducer. And what it's doing one way or another, and there are a number of different ways you can do it, it is using the pressure to cause a physical change in voltage that is going to be linear over the range 0 to 100 PSI. And we're going to amplify. It's going to have a built-in amplifier, etc., to go from 0 to 5 volts. In other words, if I put this at some... 3.1417944 PSI pressure input, the corresponding voltage output will be continuously linear with that input signal, whether that's an input measurement of pressure in this case, or you know, if we're using an LVDT, that'd be displacement. Your analog device, as we have said, is kind of infinite in its resolution, not necessarily its sensitivity. It does have a sensitivity associated with it below which maybe a small change won't register but let's say we've got that analog device so we're gonna read that in to our analog to digital converter here 0 to 5 volts let's say for a moment that we have a 3-bit analog to digital converter in other words there are only three switches the only reason we're doing a 3-bit converter is so that I can actually draw it on the screen you will probably never see fewer than 10 bits because 10 bits are very, very cheap, and Arduino has 10 bits, as we'll discuss. 3 bits, 2 to the 3, means we have 8 bins in which we can separate, into which we will evenly separate, our input signals to our analog-to-digital converter. So if our analog-to-digital converter reads from 0 to 5 volts, regardless of what my analog signal being put out by the transducer is, I can only read 0 to 5 volts on my analog to digital converter. So if I put in 6 volts, it's going to register as 5, and that's that. Because above 5, it's just like, hey, it, it, it's too high. Same thing if I go below 0, uh, it's going to register as 0. But in between 0 and 5, it's going to discretize the points that are here. So I've got continuous behavior here. The moment I hook that up to my analog to digital converter, it's going to put it in either this bin or this bin, or this bin, and you see how that works. Notice a couple of patterns here, and this is an important pattern. You'll see the term least significant bit, or LSB. That's the furthest bit to the right. And depending on the number of bits total and the range over which they're split, the least significant bit represents the smallest change possible. So from this bin to this bin is obviously the smallest step we can take. It's even across the range, so it's the same as the step from here to here. But what this is saying is the bit all the way on the right, the least significant bit, we can see that that's changing in small increments here. And that determines the, the width of that least significant bit is given by R. In this case, we have 5 volts divided by 8 bins and so we have 5 eighths of a volt per bin, so to speak. And so our least significant bit represents plus or minus 5 sixteenths of a volt. As we talked about before, it kind of splits the difference. So it splits that in half. 
So we know that we're at the center of that plus or minus 0.3125 volts, or the total width of that voltage resolution is 0.625 volts. So what that means is I'm going to get a continuous signal based on my physical relationship here between the input analog signal, whether that's pressure or displacement or whatever, and my voltage here. But when I discretize it, I'm only going to be able to get that down to a level of 5 eighths of a volt. So, for example, if I read in 56.6 PSI, say it's perfectly 56.6 .6 PSI, or 42.8 and 37.8. Let's say I take three different measurements, and they are perfectly these numbers. That's the exact measurement. Then the voltage that's going to come out of my analog device that I'll be putting into my analog to digital converter will be, the three voltage measurements will be thus. It'll be 2.83, 2.14, and 1.89. So right up until I try to discretize that, that's still a continuous measurement. But once I discretize it, these two measurements, I can't discern the difference between them. We see that because they fall in the same bin, so to speak, they're both going to register as 2.25 volts, which is the center of that bin. Same thing here, I got 2.83 volts, it's actually going to register as 2.875 volts, or you know, if we round 2.88 volts. And I can't get better resolution than that without increasing my bit depth. So what that means is when my actual measurement is 56.6 PSI, the measurement that's going to be reflected in my digital data is going to be 57.5 PSI. Likewise, where I took, say I took a measurement at 42.8 and then it decreased to 37.8, that entire time it would read 45 and that would be that. There would be no change. I would not be able to observe that change. So we have to be careful to select an analog to digital converter combination that works with our analog signal to provide us the accuracy and precision that we need. So the math behind this is pretty simple. We can see that this value is simply our full scale voltage on the analog to digital converter, which we are going to call VD. And that's that divided by 2 to the n, where n is the number of bits. And so in this case, it's 3, so it's 5 volts over 8, because that's 2 cubed. And we're going to multiply that by the full scale range of the input value, so 0 to 100 PSI in this case, so that's 100 PSI, divided by the full scale output voltage on the analog device. So in this case, they match up. The output here matches up with the input here, which is ideal. That's what we want. A lot of times, it's not going to happen. We'll see what happens on the next slide uh, with respect to that. So we can calculate basically our resolution in terms of PSI, which is the thing that we care about, by putting our numbers into this equation. And we see that we have a resolution of 12.5 PSI, or plus or minus 6 and a quarter PSI. And so if we want to improve that, if we need better resolution than that, then we can use a more advanced analog to digital converter, one with more bits, or one with a scalable range. Um, if we want if that's okay, then, then that lets us use a cheaper analog to digital converter or perhaps a faster one. So it's all about data bandwidth and you'll see that there are a number of different products out there that vary widely in cost based on bit depth and the number of channels that they have and the number of samples per second that they can collect and their accuracy. So what happens though when we have a 1 to 5 volt signal? What happens when our analog signal doesn't nicely match up with our analog to digital converter. This is very common. This happens a lot. So what if I'm reading 0 to 100 PSI still, but now my transducer's output is 1 to 5 volts, not 0 to 5? Well, we can see straight away, just kind of visually, that I just lost these two bins, so to speak. I, I just lost some of my range over which I can measure the, the pressure, effectively, the, the number of bins that I get to use. So the same equation applies. Here we see that our, uh, our bin width is still the same. It's still 0 0.625. That hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed here is that the analog signal is using up a smaller portion of my total bit depth. And so I pay a penalty for that, so to speak. And so if we calculate now using the same equation, my resolution is 5 times 100 over 2 cubed times 4. So because this number, 
decreased, I just lost some resolution. So the resolution there is 15.625 PSI. And we see that uh, obviously that's wider. Now I've instead of plus or minus six and a quarter PSI, I'm now at plus or minus seven point what seven point seven five is it seven and three quarters something like that. So it's really important that we try to select an analog to digital converter that can read in as closely as possible the total width of this analog signal and not much more. We want those two to map very closely together. You'll find a lot of analog to digital converters have a lot of different voltage ranges you can select, so they have built-in amplifiers. And so often what we'll do is we will amplify this signal. I can take this analog signal and then pass it through either filters if I'm getting noisy data or a number of other things that I can do to manipulate that signal. I can certainly amplify this with an amplification factor of 5 over 4, which would give me a, a 5 volt width output. And then I would use something to shift that signal so it's zero at zero volts. And so I'd have to verify that. So I would either have to know the amplification factor, and I can do that with a 741 op amp. Uh, some basic amplification circuits that you'll learn about in your EE classes. You can use here analog circuits such as that. You have to be cognizant that it may do some filtering as well. And if you're not really sure of the exact amplification factor you're getting, you'll need to do a calibration of that but it's really not too terribly difficult to do. And so we can amplify that signal. And if I amplify that signal from one to five, back to my zero to five volt signal, I can get back to that ideal resolution. That's going to generally be at the expense of noise and sophistication of the circuitry involved, etc. The analog to digital converters with built-in amplifiers, that will give you, you know, maybe a plus or minus 20 and a plus or minus 10 and a plus or minus 5 and a plus or minus 1 and a plus or minus 100 millivolt. You know, you can get a number of signal ranges on an analog to digital converter. You will pay for that, but those amplifiers that are built in are generally pretty well conditioned and function quite well. So let's apply this to a real world measurement and, and get back to uncertainty, which is really the core of what we're trying to get to here. Let's say we have this pressure transducer that actually is sitting in our lab. It's an SSI P51100, and it is a 0 to 100 PSI pressure transducer that puts out 1 to 5 volts. And let's say that we've connected this to an Arduino, which can read 0 to 5 volts, and it can do so with 10 bits. So it's got 1,024 divisions over 0 to 5 volts that it can read in and you really you can't manipulate either of those numbers the bit depth is fixed and the 0 to 5 volts is fixed so using the equation for the previous page we know that the output for this would be 5 volts times 100 psi over 2 to the 10th which is 1024 times 4 volts we get that we have 0 0.122 psi width on our resolution so that means if i take a reading due to the resolution alone it's going to be plus or minus 0 0.061 or half of this value so that the total width of that uncertainty is 0 0.122 psi so this is known as zero order uncertainty in the instrument it's the, the it's uncertainty that's induced the moment we take that measurement and we generally combine error sources like this using a root sum square, just because the total error output may be influenced by these together. And so what we're going to do is add these two error sources. We're going to take the transducer accuracy, which is on the data sheet from the manufacturer and is significant in this case. And we're going to look at the analog to digital converter resolution and see what we can do to improve this signal. We, we need to understand what is the actual uncertainty of my measurement here, because I took an analog measurement that I can't actually see. And by the time I can examine it on the computer as you know a cell in Excel, a, a piece of data in Excel, I've induced some error between these two that I can estimate, but I don't actually perfectly know. So the transducer accuracy, according to the manufacturer, is plus or minus 0 0.5 PSI. This is from the data sheet for this particular transducer. The error due to the resolution, as we said, is plus or minus 0 0.061 PSI, because it's half of this resolution. And so the total uncertainty due to these two sources, if we add them in quadrature, is going to be plus or minus 0 0.504 PSI. So we can see, obviously, that this dominates. This 0.504 really isn't different from this 0.5, not significantly, because this 0.5 is an order of magnitude larger than 0.061. And we think about adding in quadrature, generally your larger number is going to dominate. 
So in this particular case, we see that if I were to put infinite resolution on this, it doesn't really change the uncertainty in my measurement. It doesn't help. So we can, a lot of times, figure out what the minimum number of bits that we need is and spec that in such a way as to say this is acceptable in terms of what it's going to induce in uncertainty on my device. You can either back calculate, start with this equation here and go backward and figure out what this number is and then from there go find n or whatever it is, whether you need to figure out your amplification factor that, you, that is a minimum for you or, or whatever that is. But um, so we have to understand that what we're doing here is trying to minimize the effect of uncertainty. But this is a, an analog to digital converter that's built into an Arduino. It's cheap. It's, it's the analog to digital conversion uh, circuitry in here is, is pennies. It's unbelievably cheap. If I were to go out and get a commercial and say, well, I, I need to decrease my error here. I'm going to go buy a 16-bit analog to digital converter. Now I'm going to spend 900 bucks for all those extra bits and extra channels and stuff that I don't actually need. And so it's important that we take these things into account when we're trying to figure out what equipment is appropriate for use. In this case, if I'm willing to accept plus or minus 0 0.5 PSI, I might even be able to get by with an analog device, like an actual dial pressure gauge, which are very cheap. Uh, it, it all depends on the situation. So just to finish up, what we're doing here is we took a measurement. Let's say for a moment that we take an actual pressure measurement of 46.9 PSI. We can't see this number. We unfortunately don't get to see that number. What we get in data on our computer screen will be 46.8 PSI. And we have to understand that the actual measurement could be anywhere plus or minus 0.5 PSI from that. Uh, and that's that's what we get here. It's plus or minus 0.504, but with significant figures, you know, the, the 04 over here really wouldn't be wouldn't necessarily be significant because they're only giving us this part of the accuracy in the transducer. So the whole point of this is we can figure out what bit depth we need, what amplification factors are necessary to ensure that we get the resolution that we need. It's not terribly difficult, but it does require some attention to detail and some forward planning in terms of determining what's an okay instrument to use and what's an okay analog to digital converter to use.